Welcome, folks, to VMworld, 10th anniversary, 2013. I'm Don Sullivan. I'm going to be your moderator for this particular event, a panel discussion. In the tradition of a number of different panel discussions we've done over the years, specifically related to business critical apps and more specifically Oracle, this particular panel has a distinguished set of guests that are all extremely successful in the specific arena of virtualizing infrastructure for Oracle. They come from a very diversified, broad background. And in the next hour, I'm going to be answer, asking a number of questions of them. They can describe their individual challenges and their individual successes, most importantly. Um, we may, towards the end of uh, this particular session, have some time to go into the audience and take some questions. I'm not totally sure, depending on how the flow goes. But you know, prepare some if you want. Listen to what these folks say. They are the leaders in the industry from a number of different verticals, a number of different perspectives. All right, I'd like to introduce them all individually first, and we'll talk about these folks. And um, all the way to my left, um, Eric Buno. Um, the driving force from both the technical and leadership perspective behind the successful efforts to virtualize the infrastructure at Blue Cross Blue Shield in Michigan. A senior systems engineer, 14 years experience in this area, focus on VMware, uh, infrastructure, data center building, um, and very broad range of duties in general. So Eric. Huh? Brent Dunnington from one of our original success stories, you might have seen a case study that we've built on the University of British Columbia. Um, main focus is uh, in research, designing and deploying software hardware solutions to meet the business requirements of that university. You might remember that last year we did a, um, a session specifically on the universities from around the world. And we focused on Indiana University, University of Auckland, and we have many others, and I think most prominently, or at least as prominently as of the two, the um, University of British Columbia. Right? So Brent's been around 15 year career at Rogers Delta up in Canada. Um, been implementing these solutions for a decade, all the way back to old GSX, for those of you who remember that. So, Brent, say hello. <laughs> Before I introduce Brian, I want to say a special thanks, especially since this is uh, being recorded, to Lance Weaver, the CTO of General Electric um, Appliance and Lighting. Lance was going to be on this panel, but had a friendly emergency and incredibly graciously and professionally was able to um, get. Brian up to speed and ready to go uh, in a very, very short period of time to take over for him. So again, I uh, just want to have that listed for perpetuity that I thank Lance. And, uh, but, and Brian Pearson is here from General uh, Electric Appliances and Lighting. He's Principal Strategist, Director of Platform Infrastructure at GE Home and Business Solutions in Louisville. There is a specific session on GE Lighting and Appliance later this afternoon at 2.30 that you might want to be aware of. So Brian joined, in, joined GE in 1997, a member of the Information Leadership Management and Leadership Program. Um, Brian held a lot of roles, ranging from application architect to a variety of team leaderships. He's referred to as the evangelist of virtualization and Oracle on VMware at, at GE in general. As prior to his current role, Brian uh, was the Global Application Infrastructure Leader at GE Appliances and Lighting, and had more than 1,200 applications that he was responsible for. Um, and obviously, there's a lot of different responsibilities in a broad sense right now. So, Brian? And Scott Haverfield of the Idaho Supreme Court. And this is a particularly interesting, um, innovative implementation because this is really law enforcement and the courts themselves. So Idaho is huge. So Scott has responsibility for all the courts basically all throughout Idaho in terms of their infrastructure and all of the critical data that the courts or law enforcement need at any given point or another. And he, with the Yucca Group, did a tremendously innovative implementation using some of the more advanced Oracle features and virtualized it all. So lots of successes here, folks. Um, just there's some other activities, we'll leave this up here listed. And I'm going to walk over here, and we're going to just start asking these folks some questions. Hello? So that's the first thing I wanted not to do, is trip and fall. <laughs> I actually practiced that. 
Not tripping and falling. So I want to start out with some rapid fire questions pretty quickly to all the panelists, one after another. I want to know just in the, in the quickest way you can phrase it for you know, about five to ten seconds, what is the biggest success that you think you've had in terms of running Oracle and virtualized infrastructure? Eric? I think it's being able to uh, you know, take a business critical, critical application that most people or our end users as well as our app users believe that it couldn't be virtual and making it virtual and actually engaging them into that build process. Brent? I would say it's probably more the non-disruptive operations because with legacy physical hardware, we're unable to move you know, our workloads around, so that was a big, big win for our team. Brian? <clears throat> I think the biggest thing for us was the finance community when we virtualized Hyperion and getting them to recognize that we've actually improved the performance of the close process and that at, during close, if they need expanded resources, we're able to do that within seconds. More about GE and Hyperion later. Scott? Uh, Single-handedly, a, a single pane of glass administration. Um, being able to take a performance of Oracle and apply it to maybe changes that have happened on the app side, say here's what the problem is, if there ever is a problem, hands down. So another quick rapid fire question the other way. What applications do you have that are involved in a virtualized infrastructure now? Okay, it's the, the, our core management system, uh, which essentially you get a ticket, you, come, you, get a, you get a problem, you come into me, it goes in that Oracle database. It's all virtualized, it's 32-bit. Our databases are 64-bit. VMware lets us do it together. All right. So we virtualized um, our full, we have a, two greenfield approaches right now, um, an SAP implementation and an Oracle uh, implementation. Both of those have been fully virtualized. All modules are being virtualized um, in the environment. And I'd say that's, uh, that's, that's been our biggest uh, success thus far. Brent? So uh, one of our major applications is Blackboard Learn, and we have about 60,000 students that use it on a daily basis. So also PeopleSoft, and we have numerous other uh, internally built software applications. Ours is our main member portal. When you go on the website and you log into that, that's actually housed and back-ended with Oracle. And we have, a, as well as other Oracle applications like PeopleSoft and other things that we've developed off of Oracle. Thanks, guys. So let me change direction here a little bit now that I've got everybody warmed up. I want to talk about some of the more practical aspects of the implementations, particularly how you deal with DBAs. So, Brent, how did you facilitate a transition to the mindset that considered virtualization first? The, um, you, you had a situation there that you had to convince the DBAs to embrace this philosophy. How did you, how'd you get that accomplished? Well, it really wasn't a choice. So, we had, a, you know, at that time we were tracking about 2,500 to 3,000 VMs, and we had this section in the server room that were still legacy physical servers. So, we were very successful bringing everything into the virtual world. And senior management, you know, basically said, well, let's tackle that piece. So we had to come together as a team, you know, take our, take our time, go through test development, make sure it's scaled, everything met the requirements. And we also brought in the vendors as partners, and we also brought in a third partner, uh, House of Brick, to help us with that piece. And you told me that it really enhanced your overall collaborative environment with the DBAs? It, it did. It, it took a little bit of time, but I mean, especially now, I mean, to expand on that, we've also brought in vCloud Director, and we can, we can now deploy virtual machines to them in development in minutes instead of days, because current, before they, were, they would put a ticket in, and it would take about three or four days to get their machine. Now they can get it in 10 minutes, so they're starting to really see the value of it. So. Eric, what about you? You had a similar type of situation you had to um, uh, address. Yeah, we had a lot of DBAs and app owners who believed, you know, the virtual environment would definitely not work to our advantage, and as well as, even after we hit, hit over that speed bump, it was, yeah, I need 32 CPUs again, and I need, you know, 120 gig of RAM, so it was funny um, how, how we were able to approach it was uh, my counterpart, Jason, who's here, him and I sat down with all the DBAs in one room, and we think it was like a two-hour session and basically did almost like a, a fast track ICM course of scheduling, CPU scheduling, memory management with them. How does that work in the virtual environment? Why we constantly tell them, yeah, more CPUs is not always good. Here's what we're seeing. You know, we use uh, VC ops to actually help dictate and analytic and look at uh, trends and whatnot. Um, so showing that to them, breaking it down, they left that room with a complete different approach 
than what they did coming in because halfway through that they were saying you're not taking CPUs away from me you're not taking memory you know, away from me and they were about to strike against us but did you they say left two there. hours or two weeks two hours might have been three might have been three yeah <laughs> so uh, changing direction again Scott tell me about the scope of the uh, of your responsibilities and the responsibilities of the virtualized infrastructure and and the, not, not just the geographical scope, but the responsibility scope. Okay. Um, just to kind of paint a really broad picture, um, the state of Idaho has 44 counties, so I have 45 databases. Uh, all 44 of those databases point back to one centralized database. Um, that centralized database provides all the reporting and, uh, and also, most importantly, a website repository for people to query uh, anybody in the state. Um, so that, hit, that gets hit uh, upwards of 90 to 250,000 times a day. Um, and all that data is migrated over on an hourly basis from each county. Um, <clears throat> from a, basically, if that Oracle database in that county goes down, the court stops. So uh, to say that it's high risk is, is putting it very mildly. It's not um, just fishing licenses and all. No, it's not just fishing licenses. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a pretty big deal, and, and, and have I mentioned I work with judges, and when judges uh, can't do something in court, they're not happy about that. So, so from a thousand miles away, I get my neck wrong if that database does get uh, go down for any period of time. So everywhere from the Salmon River and the Bitterroot Range that's down right. to Boise and the Snake River, right? That's, that's correct. Brian, um, you have a number of different very innovative steps that you've taken and some great um, sort of pet names for different projects and some uh, analogies as well that I'm going to hit you with in the next uh, 48 minutes now. But first of all, start off, tell me about agile development and what that really does for you and what the whole point of that is. Okay. So again, as I mentioned, so I, I support appliances and lighting. If you guys are familiar with GE Appliances and Lighting, they're probably our most recognized brands. The businesses have been around for greater than 50, 60 years. Actually, lighting's been around for over 100. Um, and a lot of the systems that run those environments are legacy COBOL applications and, and environments that we've supported for, for quite a bit of time. Um, we had the privilege, or the benefit, I guess, of greenfield approaches for both our SAP and our Oracle implementations that are actually going on in parallel. And one of the things that we decided to do was a non-traditional approach at ERP deployments. Um, rather than do a big bang approach, uh, because we didn't have a business that was willing to, 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 to deal with that risk, uh, we decided to do very much a, I'll call it a derivative of agile software development. In this case, it was an agile release process for our ERPs. Um, what that means is we're standing up various modules and going after specific areas like a distribution center or a customer, and, um, and we're releasing in an incremental iterative fashion. That's how the ERP process was being run. So infrastructure had to kind of respond in kind because we couldn't be the ones that were the bottleneck holding up the ability to rapidly deploy these environments. And in fact, we probably have stood up uh, well over 600 virtual machine instances throughout this rapid deployment process that the ERP project teams wanted us to stand up in order to allow them to run multiple tracks and multiple trains. Um, and so this agile deployment process they chose as, a, as an application team uh, literally mandated that we as an infrastructure organization responded in kind through, through very much this virtualized approach of, of standing instances up on demand. And in fact, to a certain degree, we're empowering the ERP teams to stand those up on their own in dev and stage, for example, so that they're not bottlenecked by infrastructure. Well, Brian, um, the same question I just asked Eric and Brent, you, but you have a really large team. This is General Electric. Um, and how did you facilitate the database professionals and, and even the application owners in this case actually coming on board with this? And, and in particular, if you could extend that out to you know, any possible efforts to try to create standards and such. Yeah, so a couple of things that worked in our favor again. <clears throat> From the standpoint of the DBAs, um, God love them, and I love DBAs. I'm not a DBA. My background is more software engineering, software development. But DBAs typically like things in a specific way, they're set in their ways, and it takes time to drive that change. Um, the thing that I think helped most was, was executive technical leadership. And, and when I say that, you know, the CTO, myself, so I report into the CTO, um, we collectively agreed on the vision that we were going down this path and this is how we were going to, to, to work things going forward. Um, and that, you know, that executive sponsorship 
was essential to providing um, air cover, backup for the DBAs. If they thought something was going to go wrong or performance hit, then it's on us. It wasn't on them. So we made certain that they understood the executive leadership was there and we'll take the hits if things go wrong. Um, the other thing that worked to our favor, we have thousands of applications, legacy apps that are out there. We have over 600 database instances, all Oracle database instances, and I, I hate to admit this, but we have some Oracle 7 instances still out there running production systems. No 6. No 6, thank God. Uh, we have Oracle 7. We have probably over 100 Oracle 8 databases out there running, and less 9, some 10, and some 11. And the reality is, what we explain to the DBAs is, if I, do know, if I don't have to bare metal this anymore and I can virtualize these, I'm going to give you a pathway to keep these databases much more current on a much more readily, you know, re, you know, faster basis than you've ever historically done so that the legacy that you have to carry, that burden of support, will go away. For the app teams, the, the benefit was, again, very similar in nature. By having this rapid deployment, rapid upgrade process, we're giving them the ability to more quickly stay current on the tech stack and taking away some of the excuses around, well, it takes you eight weeks to get a server out to get me migrated from this physical environment to this one. I don't have the time to do that. Um, it took those excuses away. Scott, there was a particular application at the center of your entire virtualized infrastructure. Um, can you just talk a little bit about that and, and how you were able to um, facilitate the um, the copy of the data to all of these different locations? Oh, geez. Okay, so what we did was we created a, a, a template of, of the database that we have rolled out everywhere. So our database in all 45 locations is exactly the same. We just created that, that, that template and I pushed it out to every single one of those servers. And then we migrated from an Oracle 8 environment to Oracle 11 R2 um, in, in zero time. Um, we were able to push out all 44 locations, including in a harbor refresh of over 5,000 pieces of gear in roughly a four-month period of time. So rapid deployment is definitely there. The P to V of, of the application that sits on the uh, remote sites as well took minutes to, to, to pull from a physical server to uh, the, the existing environment it is today. And what I find particularly interesting in the data warehouse application you've got is I think a somewhat innovative use in this case, although many Oracle professionals might say, ah, this is the way it was supposed to be used, but how you've um, constructed and used, materialized views within the virtualized infrastructure. Okay, so materialized views, we're doing um, snapshot, we're, we're doing real time, and I say real time, but it's every hour, copies of every single transaction throughout the state of Idaho is coming back on a time basis using materialized view logs uh, to come back to that centralized database and then serve up. Uh, for our reporting purposes and again for our website um, that's being hammered on all day long by general public. So Brent, um, you know, kind of switching gears a little bit, you use NFS, NetApp I think, right, and direct NFS. How is that working and how important is the 10 gig infrastructure and um, how effective is that overall? So we've been very, very successful with it. So NetApp is a very strategic partner in, in our environment. Um, we have a large storage infrastructure. We're about 12 petabytes right now, and we have that across four data centers. So we need to make sure that we can consistently provide that workload that's needed for those databases. So the, data, uh, the DBAs have been more than happy with what they're getting. They've actually, where we were in a physical place before, we were able to reduce you know, the amount of machines, but actually bring up performance for those databases. So we, and to go back to that, I mean, you know, we spent a lot of time with, with VMware, with our TAM program, bringing in resources from VMware and also bringing in resources from NetApp to make sure that we were following both, uh, both vendors' recommended practices. So we made sure that, you know, if we did need to call up for support, we were in line with what their recommendations were. So that was important to us. How's that support go? Support's good. Support's, you know... Hasn't been a problem with VMware. You know, VMware and uh, NetApp work together very closely. The DBAs, you know, have, you know, with Oracle, they said, you know, it's just status quo, so. Have you had a chance to use some of the VMware, the, the Oracle support team at uh, VMware at all? Um, the DBAs have, yeah. We've, we've given them the ability, you know, to log into uh, the VMware site, open cases and all this, and, you know, it's been quite positive, so. Eric, um, Tell me about your rack implementation. How is that going? And, and what about vMotion on those rack nodes? Do you wind up having strange things happen, Christmas trees lighting up and all of this? 
So we actually have um, many different rack deployments. It varies from sandbox to dev to QA to production, all for this one big app too. Um, and we actually do vMotion with Oracle Rack today. Uh, we don't let DRS, uh, I'll, you know, vMotion that we use just for vMotion for our maintenance purposes. If we have to do something on a host or move stuff around for the case may be. And most of that is just uh, to calm, to keep the waters calm, not letting DRS move stuff around in regards to Oracle Rack. But uh, we, we haven't had any issues with that. No Christmas trees have lit up or any... I kind of uh, knew the answer to that to begin with. Any, any failover, if you want to call it. Just to let you know, um, at the EMC session yesterday, we introduced some of the data from a large stress test, a functional stress test that we're doing as a joint project between Cisco, EMC, ourselves, run through Principal Technologies, a third-party uh, testing company in North Carolina. And we're actually doing this in an extreme manner, three node rack clusters with extreme benchmark factory loads in the background. And we're not only vMotioning a single rack node, not only a double rack node, two of them, but we're purposefully vMotioning them all together. I'm referring to this as the super collider of, of uh, rack on VMware implementations, but uh, I you know it's one of these don't try this at home things. But at the same time, we're doing it to really illustrate exactly what uh, Eric just talked about in a much, much more extreme sense. It just works, folks. Okay? I'm glad. Uh, also, Eric, you had a specific network issue, and you've had some interaction yourself with uh, the GSS Oracle support team. Tell me a little bit about that, if you can. So when we first deployed uh, Oracle Rack, it was Oracle 11 point, I can't remember the exact patch build, uh, but there was a change with Oracle Rack at this build where the private network went from a unicast discovery to a multicast, and during the Oracle Rack uh, configuration script when you build Oracle, uh, it would fail every time. So we engaged uh, everyone under the sun, as you can imagine, you know, between Cisco, between VMware, Oracle themselves. Everyone does the whole finger pointing thing. And it actually went through uh, VMware where we got a really, really, I, I'm trying to think of what her role is. Yvonne? Yvonne, yeah. Over, she's in Ireland, but she's probably the best Oracle and VMware engineer I've ever spoke to and dealt with. And we were able to nail it down and make a long story short. It was actually something specific. Uh, well, two, there was two things. One of them being uh, our network environment did not have a rendezvous point for multicast in that specific VLAN. Once we got that uh, figured out, we, found, we realized that the OS was able to do multicast, but Oracle wasn't. And that came down to a VMware tools driver issue with the VMX net either two or three driver was not supported. Uh, so we had to go to the E1000 and it was uh, resolved. The final resolution you have to run, we were on ESX 5.0 and it doesn't matter what update you're in in there, you have to actually go to 5.1 VMware tools uh, to have that fixed and there's a way to slipstream that in. Uh, Scott, I have to get back to this massive geographical area that you're responsible for. What about the defined SLAs and, and HA? Is, is that been adequate in all of these different sites? Okay, well, to take a giant slap and hit some wood, but we haven't had to worry about HA or, or, or my SLAs, but our self- Nothing ever fails? No, it never fails. Um, our self-inflicted five nines that we all are, have to adhere to, right? Um, we're, we're meeting that absolutely uh, today um, because, and I'm gonna speak specifically about the, the master site, the, the data, where, data warehouse, because that's my biggest one. It's every single database in one. It sits on multiple hosts. I'm rebuilding that one. It's sitting on UCS. It will be sitting on UCS uh, shortly. Um, we do have DRS enabled on that, but I don't have it fully automated. I have it manually automated. So I, I'm not migrating or moving to Oracle at any time. It's, 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 it's very much pinned to one location to, to, to appease Oracle's requirements. Um, but if I do have to move it, which I have had to move once for under a 10 minute period of time to fix um, some hardware issues, but it, it simply just works. It, I, I don't have to worry about HA. I don't have to worry about performance. It just simply works. So let's um, talk a little bit about larger types of applications. And Brian, you mentioned Hyperion before. Tell me a little bit about 
how that's working, because we all know, know the Hyperion S base is a lot more pr process intensive, yep. requires a lot more server resources. How are you doing there? So, you know, it was an interesting sell as well because our, <clears throat> our financial business counterparts um, were being sold heavily by Oracle on an Exolytics platform. Um, and it was a very interesting, we, we literally had as an infrastructure organization to go and, and kind of defend the commodity x86 approach <clears throat> with virtualized Hyperion versus this purpose-built, you know, Exologic, Exadata, Exolytic system from Oracle. Um, and what we essentially, what we did with them was we explained to them, just give us a shot to show you how much more cost-effective our solution is and let us see if we can achieve the performance gains that you're looking for. So we had an older Hyperion instance that was sit on bare, sitting on bare metal. Uh, we took that and moved it over to a virtualized environment. Now granted, obviously, the performance gains I'm getting ready to reference are partially because we went from, you know, two and a half year old gear to new UCS blade computing, right? So the virtualization itself wasn't necessarily the gain of performance, the gain was in the new hardware. But we went from what it took to run GL, general ledger and reporting, which we run multiple cycles throughout the course of, you know, multiple times a day through the closing process, we increased that by 55%. So or I should say we reduced the time taken by 55% in moving to this environment. The, the, I'd say the biggest thing that's helped us in the Hyperion space has been with the financial community. And if any of you guys have ever dealt with financial close in your respective organizations, the biggest challenges that you run into are the spikes that will always occur at month end, quarter end, and year end. And that is when your financial organization gets extremely frustrated if performance is not optimal. What we've been able to do um, simply by shoring up, whether it's vCPUs, whether it's RAM, whether it's, it's the IO subsystem, if, if we need to boost capacity and performance for close, we're able to do that on demand literally within minutes to get that additional capacity to the Hyperion system. And then when it's done, we scale it right back down. So we're doing that more of a, a manual process right now until we can automate the algorithms to decide what's the right way to scale it up and scale it down dynamically. Um, but that's been a tremendous benefit to the financial organization because they continue to see performance gains um, in this environment and, and no pain. Um, historically, had they had to go out and buy an Exolytics machine, if they wanted to increase capacity, you're talking a six week potentially lead time to, to add capacity versus minutes, which is what we can do and, and enable them to close the books faster. So let me stay with the applications theme just a little bit and sort of delve into your, your SAP implementations. Mm -hmm particularly the central instances. How's that work? So we, um, we actually brought in, we, we did a design, a reference architecture, um, and then we brought in a, an expert from VMware and an expert from SAP. We brought them in for a two-week engagement to sit down and review our reference architecture and take a look, does this make sense? Are we doing things the right way? And what we determined, and, and I'm by no means an SAP deep expert, so if those are in the audience, you'll hopefully know some of these references, but there are two critical components for every SAP module, and they're called the message server and the NQ server. And these systems need to be highly available. So what we opted to do, because these are not heavyweight components of each of the modules, so like SAP ECC has these instances, SAP SCM has these instances, GRC, et cetera, so we basically are using VMware FT, fault tolerance, for those NQ and message servers so that we have true fault tolerance, immediate failover if there's a problem. And we expect to do more of that as release, you know, further releases of VMware support going from one vCPU to you know, two and hopefully more vCPUs than that. Um, but so we had a rather notable demo a couple of years ago showing SMP FT, not quite productized yet, but you're going to see it, we promise. Yes, I shouldn't say promise, should I? No, yeah. safe harbor. I expect to see it. Um, so Scott, sticking with that application theme, and I, I know I asked you about the materialized use before, but in general for your DSS system performance-wise, how's, how's that working for you? <laughs> okay, I'm going to answer that question with a story, and I told Marlon this story. Um, <clears throat> as every IT guy in this place knows, um, no one calls the IT guy to tell them that everything's great. And that, that I just want to let you know you're my computer's running really, really well. Sort of you know, like an umpire in sports, right? You don't, you don't, right. If you, you don't know their names if they're really good. Ex exactly. And, and that call's never going to happen. If you do it, my resume is available. I can get it to you. Um, Everybody knows Don Deckinger from 1985. But, but I got a call, and this is shortly after we did a migration onto this new system from one of our counties. It's a bigger county. 
And she was in a panic. She was just worked up, as you wouldn't believe. I mean, dogs and cats were living together in the streets, and, and, and mass chaos had gone on, and I hate your life, and you ruined my family, and that kind of thing. And, and finally, after all of that happened, I, I talked her off the ledge, and I said, well, what's going on? And she said, well, I, I run the support every end of the month, and it takes typically three hours to run. Okay, pretty good report. I said, so what's the problem? It ran in four minutes. I said, okay. Is all the data there? It looks like it. I ran it five times. It took four minutes every time. <laughs> I said, okay. Is all the data there? Yeah, all the data's there, but that can't be right. It can't go from three hours to five minutes. That's when the Tiger Woods air pump, this <laughs> pump came up out of my cube, and I took that as, a, as I, I, this, this worked. This is working. I can, I, can, I can see that it worked. And I looked at the performance, and I saw, every, I saw where she ran that report. I saw her pull the data, and it was quickly, and it was there. Mission accomplished. Brett, you've notably, um, and I know we've published this, and you've talked about it to me, um, really reached a level of performance that was greater than we had prior in, in, in the physical world. Um, how did this happen? What was the right sizing exercise like? Yeah. So, like I said, you know, the, the DBAs and the systems team kind of were put together to put this project together and complete it. And one of the goals was to provide as good as performance as physical, if not better. So we, we, we exceeded that. And how we did that is we brought a partner, and I talked about it earlier today, was that House of Brick came in, and they were a recommendation direct from VMware because they were experts in the field in doing this. So they came in and kind of worked as a, a, middle per, a middle tier between the DBAs and the, and the systems group to get this out and deployed. So basically we worked through you know, test dev, load testing, and basically made sure that each, each stage of the project was you know, the performance matched what was required and what was needed. Um, and in the end goal is we were actually able to reduce the amount of hardware that was required before. What about um, how you use vMotion for hardware maintenance? So for our team, it's important because before, you know, we couldn't do, we had to have outages when we did hardware maintenance. And, and when we talk about hardware and maintenance, is a lot of these systems were very, very legacy machines to the point where the staff that put them in had already retired from the university. So the new people coming in would look at these things and say, what are these things? You know, they're... 15 U high and they hum like refrigerators and we didn't know what they were. So, you know, the new stuff that came in, we had to, we had to modernize. We had to bring in new equipment and move these things to virtual so we could do those non-disruptive emotions for maintenance. It's easy. It is easy, yeah. All right, this is my favorite question of this entire hour. Oh, um, and this is something I love to talk about. But Brian, please tell me about how you're using, and you know, we have to keep the details a little bit careful here, but how you're using SRM, how you're using, how you have these multiple data centers at you know, hundreds, if not a thousand miles apart. Mm -hmm. And what I really want to know is this analogy of the time it takes to deliver a pizza. Yeah. So uh, we are fortunate in that we have a very good partnership with both VMware and Cisco. And, um, and that we have an organization in our infrastructure group that is willing to take a lot of risk and a lot of, and a, and a lot of uh, gambles. Um, and so what we started to use, because obviously we virtualized both the Oracle and the SAP environment, we obviously started to find the SRM, uh, Site Recovery Manager Protection Groups, right? And, and we did this in a way to make certain that if we had to take core Oracle e-business suite and, and move it from data center A to data center B, we had all of its relative dependencies, and I'll call it the ecosystem that was core for EBS to function, defined as an SRM group, and then we can lift it and drop it and move it into um, you know, data center B. We obviously have a SAN backend that is real-time replicating within literally five seconds or so between the two sites. Um, and then one of the other pieces, and I think it's okay to share this, this technical detail, right now we're doing layer two stretching or spanning uh, using OTV. So overlay transport virtualization, and that was the partnership with Cisco. And that has worked extremely well to the point where um, we are now able to take an entire Oracle EBS instance or even an SAP ECC instance, and within the time that, as we mentioned, it takes to deliver a pizza, order it and deliver it, I'll call that 45 minutes. We won't do Domino's because I don't think they're allowed to do that anymore for uh, legal reasons. I actually delivered for Domino's in 1986. Yeah, it was 30 minutes. I think they had a lot yeah, of so accidents. It was a lot of fun. And, yeah. <laughs> 
My so dots and B210. We didn't want any accidents in this process. So roughly a 45 minute window and um, we literally have the, the systems. We've done this, we did it with dev, we stage, and then we moved to production. And we have now moved all of those workloads to alternate data centers and actually brought them up, configured that, confirmed that everything was running and we actually ran our production instance inside of the alternate data center. Um, sometimes for a couple days, sometimes for a week, and then we will move it right back. Um, no IP addressing changes, right? That's where we did the, the layer two spanning and stretching. Um, and it, it's, it's worked phenomenally. Now we're hopeful with you know, VMware NSX and some of the other network virtualization capabilities, we'll be able to do you know, layer three between all of these, these data centers and not even have to do OTV stretching. Um, but and of course, you're hearing about some of that at this conference yep. and the release of NSX, NSX and so on. The real true network virtualization um, in 5.5 and beyond. But folks, really, let me emphasize that. Keep in mind what they've effectively accomplished with House of Burke and GE mm -hmm. is really to abstract the data center over a thousand miles or so. And it's, it's really quite incredible. So just again, a shameless plug, there will be a session at 2.30 this afternoon specifically focused on the GE lighting and appliance success story in this regard. So look that one up. Um, Eric, you have a, a, an, an interesting innovative track here in which you're considering at this point, I know it's in the early stages, but using VPlex for some of this, how is this going to fit in? So instead of taking tier one and doing like an SRM approach or some type of active uh, pass over, fail over, we're doing tier zero and basically an application that cannot be down whatsoever, taking both of our data centers. So if you're uh, in the extranet, internet, and you want to service this application, using different load balancers, you will hit either data center and hit that front end app, which is going to be back-ended by an Oracle rack, active-active, so each node is sitting in each data center writing to the same LUN, we'll say, that's virtualized with EMC vPlex. So I can actively write and simultaneously write in this data center and this data center, and the vPlex technology will you know, make sure that the locking takes place and, and everything else. What's the distance between those data centers? Uh, the EMC's recommendation is you have to stay sub five millisecond. So based on that and RTT, I think you have to be no, no more than 100 miles. And that's about what you But ours is about 45, 50 miles away. Yeah, 100's uh, pretty good. <laughs> um, so on that note, Brian, let me go back to you. Your overall perspective, your mindset in regards to high availability in Oracle Rack. How is it evolving? Yeah, so when we, again, started down this journey, uh, and it started in 2011 to go down both ERP paths, um, we, at the time, had no experience with Rack. We'd never had a need to use Oracle Rack. So we said, all right, we're going to use Oracle Rack for this EBS implementation. We stood up bare metal Rack. We found out pretty quickly that there were a lot of inherent complexities in managing Rack, especially with an existing DBA organization that had really never embraced using the RAC technology. Um, and we found out that you know, doing some analysis and comparisons between VMware HA and, um, and what we were able to do with RAC, yeah, there were some compelling values with RAC in, in, in so much as, um, you know, let's say you have a four node RAC cluster. Um, when a node eviction occurs because a node has failed, the, the RAC node itself is paused anywhere from one to four minutes was the time that we, we kind of assessed. Um, the transactions are at least kept, and, and the state of transactions are kept, but you're still looking at a one to four minute pause, essentially some downtime. Um, if we do VMware HA, uh, and we just basically do, I'll call it atomic, atomic instances of databases, right? So no more rack, just it's a virtualized Oracle database. You're looking at, based on our current startup times, two to six minutes. So it did not become a compelling reason to say we could do rack versus this. The time differences were not substantial enough to make it the only reason we would make a determination to say, you know what, we're going to jettison rack. We're going to go back to a virtualized Oracle database. We'll call it atomic workloads, and that's what we're doing. Um, it simplified the management. We didn't have to buy extra licenses from Oracle, so no Oracle rack. We didn't have to retrain the DBAs on what is arguably a much more technologically complex solution. Um, it made troubleshooting, uh, depending on how many instances you had in that rack environment, extremely difficult. And quite honestly, we found that you know, one of the benefits of rack is you could do rolling patches. Well, when you get into the details, there's only certain kinds of rolling patches that really take advantage of it. Not quite so easy, is it? No, it's really not. And most of the things that we already do anyway, app level, OS level, database level patching, for the most part still required some type of an outage. So rack didn't give us much of a benefit there. 
It just added complexity that was creating problems during you know, any types of downtime or, or outage conditions. So we opted to say, you know what, we're going to go down the path of uh, a single autonomic workload database um, that's drastically reduced, simple, you know, drastically reduced the complexity. We've not seen any issues from doing that. And again, as I mentioned earlier, as we expect to see VMware fault tolerance continue to improve beyond one vCPU or two vCPUs, um, we will likely look at that versus just using VMware HA for those database nodes so that we have even less time, right? So with fault tolerance, it should be instantaneous um, failover from one node to the other as opposed to the two to four, six minutes that I referenced. What I find particularly impressive about the mindset is the adherence to what the real philosophy behind high availability needs to be. And that means that you must do a complete analysis on an application by application, database by database level to determine what your real SLA and requirements yep. are. And if you really are in a situation where you truly have a five nines requirement, you probably are going to go with rack. But those same exact points apply to why you would put rack on virtualized infrastructure. And what, what they've done here is you know, really embedded that mindset, that philosophy into their, what effectively, uh, ultimately, are you know, standards of, of assessment. So I find that particularly compelling about this. Um, Scott, you have an, an interesting way of um, implementing what are production level systems? And, and to be honest, I don't know if you even know this, that uh, the last webinar that we did, Daryl Smith is sitting out in the audience, I think Chris Williams might be someplace, they delivered a best practices webinar, a new updated webinar, in which we at VMware really finally included some of the ideas of overcommitment of resources into our best practices with you know, the proper caveats and so on. But you've been successful with this for quite a while. Tell me about it. <laughs> overcommitment. Um, Overcommitment for me took a lot of staring at a screen and seeing if I was doing anything backwards, incorrect, or just stupid. Um, essentially, when we went down this road three years ago, there was no baseline, there was no white papers, and there was no um, real um, anyone to call and, and ask how to do this. But what we were able to do was, I think, Ultimately, it's, 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 I built up the hardware high enough, big enough, and grand enough thinking I just didn't know um, that we were able to establish that, that baseline. I'm, I'm not touching memory ballooning at all because I just don't need to. I am caching the entire database in memory, um, but yet I'm, I'm not overcommitting the memory resources of that box. So what I did do is I virtualized Oracle and just left it alone um, and just left it sitting on its own host by itself and let it steam along for six, eight months and, and then really see and then analyze that data and see what did it do from a CPU level, what does it do from a memory level, and then what, did it, what does it do from a storage level. Uh, and then from there, I was able to introduce, I'm, I'm running more machines on that same host and I'm, I'm leaving Oracle to do its own thing, but yet it's never, ever, ever overcommitted, per se, from overutilization of that physical memory um, once, ever. So you take from that the lesson, if you will, is that Scott is extremely aware of what the real moment-to-moment, -moment, if you will, resource requirements are in all four dimensions of performance, the CPU, memory, the network, and the storage, and is actually able to utilize the physical resources, you know, with a somewhat modest budget, I imagine, in the state of Idaho, to be able to very, very efficiently use those physical resources to get as much out of that overall infrastructure as possible. And as I said, this is why we enhance the best practices guidelines in terms of our public facing collateral, just to sort of start to get into that role, get, get, get into that mode of thinking. It is important though, the right sizing, as Brent's described a little bit before, exercise is extremely important so that you know exactly what real resources are required. So Eric, you've, um, you've had some other interesting experience even before Blue Cross Blue Shield with iSCSI and so on. It, give me a little bit of a flavor of that because I found that quite compelling in terms of story. So uh, in a previous life, I, I did actually stand up a uh, rack with our DBAs uh, for a mainstream application and the back end storage was, was iSCSI, it was Dell Equalogic. And back this was you know, four or five years ago where iSCSI, Fiber Channel, that big fight and how you know, can one even uh, match up to another in performance and, and whatnot. 
Uh, we were able to do it. We did it. Uh, it was VMware 3.5 back then with physical HBAs, offloading most of all of that into, into the HBA itself um, and establishing the sessions that way. We then, as years went on, moved and migrated up to vSphere 4, uh, and we took the physical HBA out because vSphere 4, you're not allowed to uh, play around with queue depth, not allowed to play around with max burst, burst length. A lot of those different tu uh, tweaking parameters, tuning parameters that you can do now are more locked into the driver that comes with ESX and ESXi even today. Um, so we were able to just use a true tow card, so at least you do have some offload of uh, TCP as well as the iSCSI frames, but you just it simplifies the management uh, at a network level, basically. Now, folks, I'm going to ask the panel a couple of questions, each one of them, and again, somewhat rapid fire, but take your time with it. Um, we haven't talked too much about some of the peripheral tools yet, VC Ops, and particularly the adapters for VC Ops, and specifically the OEM or Oracle Enterprise Manager plugin for VC Ops, mm -hmm. as well as some others. So let me just go down the row here. Um, and Eric, what, what about, and you know, I realize not everybody's using all these tools, and what I actually also like to know if there are any other third party tools. We have a number of third party tools that um, we, we very much embrace. I do joint presentations with and so on. So, and I'm, I'm not totally even sure of the answers to this, but uh, Eric, tell me about some of the tools, VC Ops or management and monitoring tools that you use. So we use VC Ops today to, to look at all the analytics of, of that VM as it's been running since its birth, really, because it's been so new in our environment. But we maintain back six months in VC Ops just so we can see a trend. And today, because of this new app, we're actually only putting 50% of the traffic to it. Um, that app was life cycled to this new virtual environment. It still also exists on physical and different WAS nodes. So with, uh, with a load balancer, we can move and, and cycle only you know, whatever load we want to. So today it's 50% we're ramping up. So we can actually see the trend of as we add more users, more IOPS come in, more of that demand load as well as the app itself in, you know, changes and, and uh, develops itself into new iterations. How does that affect uh, the app workload, the effect of memory, CPU scheduling at the host level, as well as the disk? And something I'll go back to of how, uh, how we have Oracle Rack architected, we actually put the ASM disks into a, a data store cluster, and they separate out into different data store LUNs themselves. Uh, with VC Ops coming back around, we're able to look at those analytics and take a look at it and make sure no other VMs are stomping on that one uh, and we're not having any, any IOP contention. Brent, what about you up in the great university in Vancouver? So we're also using VC Ops and we're in the process now of using the third party plugins. We're looking at adding in you know, the SCOM, our System Center Operations Manager from Microsoft plugin. We're looking at adding in the NetApp plugin, all these plugins to get that single pane of glass view of, of what we're doing in the environment. We're also using the on-command suite from NetApp to monitor our storage. You know, the VC Ops tool is great because, you know, we can build that dashboard and deliver it to the DBAs to watch with, with you know, and then the feedback's been very, very positive, right? So the, your DBAs like and are using the dashboards right out of VC Ops without even the OEM plugin at the moment? Yes. Cool. What about you, Brian? <clears throat> so we acquired VCOPS earlier this year, and we are still in, I'll say, the infancy of implementing it and using it to do capacity management, capacity planning. But it was part of, a, will say, a multi-pronged approach. We, um, we, as I'm sure a lot of folks in the audience, um, started using ServiceNow as our, our ITIL CMDB platform about two and a half years ago. And so that is our, you know, our problem management, incident management um, platform of choice. What we use below that is we, we, we needed a mother of monitors or a manager of managers. And so we ended up going down the path of Xenos. Um, and, and Xenos has actually been pretty useful for us in terms of taking event correlation from our variety of tools, whether it's SCOM, whether it's OEM, um, whether it's NetScout, whether it's, it's a variety of tools that every, I'll say, technological domain, be it network, database, they all have their own tools they want to use. So we let them feed that into Xenos. And Xenos then in turn integrates into ServiceNow to create incidents and tickets. What we've done with VCOPS is we're working through VCOPS to do the integrations now with OEM plugin. Um, we are also looking to integrate that into Xenos so that we can take when we think there's a capacity problem and, and a capacity issue and proactively create an incident through Xenos into ServiceNow so that our organization knows from a, from a, I'll say, proactive management, hey, 
you've got a, a cluster over here, or you've got a, a VM over here that's that's starting to, um, to to be starved for resources. We need to do something different from a capacity planning point of view. Um, so we're very much working through this as a, a multi-phased approach, and it started with ServiceNow, Xenos, event correlation, and now we're with VCOPS trying to further feed those those event correlations. The the other thing that I'll add in um, is VIN, the virtual infrastructure navigator that you get with this. Um, I have been a big proponent for a long time of CMDB. We started this journey on CMDB back in 2002. So we've been doing it for 11 years. Um, we did one CMDB, we did our implementation, and eventually we got it into ServiceNow. Um, there's an interesting concept going on right now that even says rethink ITIL and rethink the CMDB. As we do automated provisioning of these environments, we are logging that data. We are, we are using API calls into ServiceNow to automatically register the assets that are getting built. Because prior to that, it required humans to go in and actually update this information to the CMDB, and the CMDB was historically never accurate. So we're looking very much at, I, I don't want any manual intervention in the CMDB. This should be all automated through our build processes and how we can leverage VCOPS to help us with that along with VCAC, the vCenter automation uh, tool, which used to be Dynamic Ops, as we provision environments. So that's uh, it's been working out well. I, I don't want to sound like a broken record here. We're using VCOPS exactly the same way these guys are using it as well. Um, in addition to that, I'm using uh, the backbone <clears throat> of my system is, is VNX, so I'm using storage uh, reporting and, and performance on that one, so I'm able to see the tiering and what's going on in the background of that. Um, and in addition to that, uh, is our, our hardware platform statewide is, is Dell, so we're able to use uh, OMSA appliance to uh, monitor and maintain uh, the, at a hardware level what everything's doing in the counties for alerting purposes as well. So I have one more question I want to run around the panel with, um, and it has to do with the future ideas, what we're releasing this week or announcing this week, or uh, the sort of broader ideas of the software-defined data center, or anything feature-wise. What are you most looking forward to? And, and, and the reason I ask that is that these are all extremely successful companies with extremely successful individuals in this narrow space of running Oracle on vSphere. So what is it? Scott, to start with, if you can, what are you most looking forward to or something you're really looking forward to coming down the pike? Oh, geez, Louise. Um, anytime I ever look at a new product or a new enhancement, since I do wear 15 hats and it's at a moment of time I don't know what hat I'll be wearing, it's that single pane of glass. It's how can I better manage my infrastructure from one spot, not clicking on 15 different things. One thing I'm looking forward to is the integration to, with UCS uh, into vSphere, the integration of VNX into, into vSphere, the integration of Avamar into vSphere, all of the things that I do now and I go three different spots to find them, having those in one pane of glass from me and my very slim staff, very beneficial. So I'm going to answer a little bit for you, Brian. Uh, I'm for you looking forward to SMPFT, but anything else? Um, yeah, so I, I think the biggest thing and yes, it's at the hype cycle right now. We all know that with, with network virtualization, network virtualization, virtualization platform, right? You guys have heard a lot about NSX this week from VMware. Um, you know, there are some other vendors working in this space as well. Ultimately, we are, I, I would say, you know, is the DBAs were easy, right? That was not a hard cultural change for us. The network engineers, this is the harder change, to be honest. This is the one that we are still struggling with, despite having pushed this for at least five or six months now. Um, it is taking, and I'm not a network guy, so it's easy for me. I'm a software guy, so I, this is very natural to me to think of virtualization of the so, of the of the network at a software tier makes complete sense. To a network guy that's been doing layer one, layer two, layer three, they're like, mm, I don't know how that's going to work. So I'm absolutely looking forward to see how, and, and we're already working to kick the tires of NSX. We have a beta and a, and a lab built up inside of one of our data centers. Um, that one, I'm looking to see the the material benefits from very quickly. Um, and how we continue to get our, our network engineers bought into it. That, that I think, is going to be really the next compelling uh, shift, mindset shift for us. And what are you looking forward to, Brent? So it would be the NSX product. So like I said before, is we're a service provider for our university. So we currently have about you know, just over 4,000 VMs and about 1,000 virtual desktops. And one of the big projects lately has been vCloud Director. So we can offer self-service because currently, you know, before this piece, people would wait three, four days for their VM, and then we'd get the ticket, someone would manually provision it, but now they can do that in minutes. So they can provision their VMs in minutes, but the problem is we still have that three-day ticket window to do the network. So 
being able to virtualize the network and deliver the whole thing in under 10 minutes, you know, the, the Tiger Woods fish exactly. pump, as you said, right? So that, that's a big piece for us, but, you know, as We'll you, just keep it at that, though, with Tiger. Yeah, but to repeat to your thing, I mean, the DBAs are, was an easy hurdle. I think networking is going to be a longer discussion, so. Yeah. Um, folks, before I ask Eric the same question, we've got about five minutes left, and anybody who'd like to answer a, uh, ask a question, um, yeah, you probably should ask it before you answer it, right? But come on up. Uh, the, I thought the mics were going to be out in the aisles. They're not. So just come on up on either side, and I'll come down, and I'll give you the mic. So just line up over there. There's no mics out there, are there? Yes, there are. Oh, there are. Okay, sorry. They're, just line up at the mics then, and I don't have to move. So Eric, your answer. Uh, same thing as the NSX, and I think if you guys attended the general session, one of the key points uh, that came up, which I'm surprising wasn't higher, was that 70% of your traffic has got to go up to a northbound router, even if it's in the same you know, virtual host that your virtual guests live on. It's got to go up and then back down. So I think with NSX, being able to route with inside of that, we'll call your virtual cloud or your virtual private cloud within a, a single host is going to be much, much more efficient. Sir. Uh, Jason Dizich from Blue Cross and Blue Shield in Michigan. I work with Eric and I talked to you earlier, Brian. And uh, you and I share a similar role uh, as far as technical leadership is concerned. Uh, I'm sure we sit in meetings talking about CapEx and OpEx and ROI with senior, senior leadership and C-level executives. And, and my question is, could you share with the audience and the other decision makers and leaders in the room on, on some of the challenges and, and how you were able to overcome them to allow these, uh, these teams to share in the success stories that, uh, that you shared over the last hour? So it makes certain I'm following that. So how did we come over, overcome the challenges of OpEx, CapEx challenges? With Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the discussions that that we really had with the senior level executives were actually, I, I would be honest, I, I think they were the easiest we had, to be honest. Again, our biggest challenges were with the various technical domains and silos that we had, be that network engineering, be it you know compute and system administration, um, be it the DBAs. The, the C-level executives, they were all bought in because to a certain degree, you know, you, you determine to reveal how much detail you want to reveal. You don't go into the nuts and bolts of it. You basically say, look, this is going to give us an opportunity to potentially increase the, because we, we have a highly dense environment, right? We built a new data center. It's a very dense environment. So the CapEx and the, and the number of VMs that you get per environment, vastly better than what we would have gotten on bare metal 15U, you know, rack mount servers or E25Ks. So when they looked at that and they looked at the maintenance, because what we also decided to do for x86 hardware, we're not paying maintenance. Why bother? It's throwaway. Mm -hmm. Trash it. Let go. Bring a new one in. We have warranty on this stuff for three years. If it doesn't get placed under warranty, we're going to refresh it in three years anyway because it's compute gear. So when we looked at that, they were like, oh, this is a no-brainer. Okay, you're, you're saving me CapEx. This is great. And from an OpEx point of view, we actually said we're cutting down on the amount of hardware maintenance we have to pay by going down the commodity hardware and not purpose-built. It's the same basic argument. Mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. So, folks, um, we are over time. We're going to have to cut this off now. Um, we will stay around and we'll answer some questions as time goes along in the next uh, 10 minutes or so. But please, the Oracle Customer Success Stories panel, um, let's hear it for them.